Um, good evening. Thanks again for everybody um, for all your participation. Um, my name is Taylor Kilgore. Um, I'm the managing editor at Simpson Street Free Press. Um, I've been with Simpson Street Free Press since I was in middle school um, and I graduated from La Follette High School. Shout out to Savion. <laughs> um, and I also graduated from UW Madison um, School of Journalism. Um, so welcome to this virtual school board forum. Um, so our guests tonight are five candidates seeking election to the Madison School District School Board Education or Board of Education. Wayne Strong and Nikki Vandermeulen are candidates for, our, for seat seven. Maya Pearson and Chris Gomez Schmidt are candidates for seat number six. And Savion Castro is running unopposed for school board seat to which he has was appointed last year for. So asking questions this evening are several local journalists, um, but also myself. Um, so Jenny Peake is a digital news editor for Wisconsin Public Radio and an education reporter for Isthmus. Amanda Quintana is a general ass uh, assignment reporter and news anchor for Wisconsin TV News 3 Now. Um, you will hear a question from her, but she um, was unable to join us the, uh, from video today. <coughs> Scott Gerard is the education beat reporter for the Capital Times, and Logan Rogue is the education beat reporter for Wisconsin State Journal. We also have Leilani McNeil, um, who is a student at Madison West High School and a teen editor at Simpson Street Free Press, and Josepha DeCosta, uh, who is also a, a student, and she goes to Madison La Follette High School and uh, is also a teen editor at Simpson Street. So for the interest of time, um, again, our format will be really simple. Uh, a journalist will pose a question and each candidate will have one minute to respond. Uh, we have our timekeeper here, Sarah Useche, um, who is a college student, a teacher and a reading specialist at Simpson Street Free Press. She's also a co-editor for La Prenza Libre de Simpson Street publication. And so she will, her plan is to hold up a 30 second card um, for kind of your halfway mark and then a, I believe a one minute time card, which will signify that's the end of your time for your response. Um, I think she's going to also try to use sound to indicate like for you when to stop so you don't have to constantly look at her bubble. Um, but if that gets disruptive anyway, then we'll just stop halfway through. Any questions? Um, also, yeah. Thank you. Um, I did want to establish an order um, for responses. So we kind of, um, so what I was thinking is that we will go with the order of Wayne, Nikki, Maya, Chris, and then Savion. So that will, what we, that's what we'll start with. And then we're going to kind of just mix up who starts, if that makes sense. So we will start with Wayne this time, but maybe, um, the next question we'll start with Nikki, but we'll still kind of have that same type of order. Okay, we'll just, hopefully we'll figure out how that works. <laughs> All right. All right, so we will begin with the first question if everyone's ready. Mm -hmm. All righty, so our first question is actually from Scott Gerard from the Cap Times. So Scott, you can go ahead and again um, we will start with Wayne for um, your response um, once the question is asked. So MMSD's behavior education plan generates a fair amount of discussion in Madison. While many in the community support a restorative justice approach with kids, school staff have questioned whether teachers and principals have the resources to support the new BEP policies. As a school board member, what is your vision for the behavior education plan and what approaches will most benefit students and frontline school staff? I think what we have to do uh, with respect to the behavior education plan and with respect to discipline in general is to really start looking at some of the root causes of what's creating the behavior in our students. And I don't know that we've done a satisfactory job of doing that. I feel like we can do a better job of getting down to what the issues are affecting these students why they're bringing this behavior, behavior uh, into school and how we can help um, address it. Um, when you look at the fact right now that 31 and a half percent of African-American students get suspended uh, out of school suspensions from the district, that's astronomical and it's alarming to me uh, that the rate has gotten this high. 
So I think what we need to do is to, uh, as we look at the plan, uh, make some uh, adjustments to the plan, but really focus on the systemic issues that are affecting the behavior of these children. We need to look at root causes. So many of these kids are dealing with so many issues outside of school, trauma, uh, homelessness, um, um, abuse, neglect, all sorts of things. And they're bringing that into the schools and our schools aren't really prepared to, uh, equipped to deal with that. So we need to make sure that we're garnering the resources that will help these kids get the help that they need so that we can address the behavioral issue and then begin to engage them uh, as students in terms of, of uh, trying to uh, teach them um, in their educational uh, journey. Nikki? Yes, um, the behavioral education plan in theory is a good idea. Unfortunately, in practice, it does not work. And Wayne has a point, 31.5% of African Americans are, sus are suspended out of school. 53% of the disabled are. Our black, brown, and disabled children are the most suspended out of school. Clearly, this is not an equitable approach. What I would do is I need to have teachers, people on the front lines, the ones who should be helping create a behavior plan that works, because they're the ones who are carrying out the behavior plan. They're the ones making the decisions on how it works and what's feasible given their time schedule, their workload, and to prevent burnout. And I think we didn't do that. We talked to focus groups, we took to, talked to principals, or we talked to teachers who were handpicked. I want to hear from the actual teachers, not just, oh, this is what we are going to say. I want to hear from actual staff right on the front lines on that. And I think that's the only way to save it. Maya? So I agree a lot with what Nikki said. Um, I think it definitely is one of those things where we, we need to talk directly with students. And we need to talk with teachers and engage them into that process. I also think that we need more training. Um, and that also includes um, hiring more SE, um, SEAs and hiring support staff um, and more counselors, trauma-informed people uh, or trauma-informed staff to assist that. Um, because if we can get more training um, for those things, then I think that the behavior definitely um, would come down, but we also need to talk with teachers and students and and know exactly what it is that um, we need to adjust for it. Chris? Um, the behavior education plan initially did, and it still does, have the important goal of reducing the disparities, um, but implementation has been a challenge. Um, changing practices um, is dependent on building relationships um, with students, between students and staff, and using restorative justice practices. And, and to implement that effectively, it takes resources and it takes time. Um, I think we've lost our way a little bit along the way. We have to look at the places and the schools where we are having success in this and see if we can scale that up and build on the practices that are working and um, find the places where it's not and, and figure out what adjustments are, are needed. Um, I, I think that a stable principal leadership is really needed, especially in our middle schools. And that's something that has been a, a big change over the years. Um, so we need to make sure that we are retaining our staff, um, both our principals and our teachers, um, to make sure that, that the relationships with students is, is part of this work. Sabian? Yep, yeah. yeah, so when talking about the behavioral ed education plan, it's important, excuse me, to remember where we were before with this student handbook, which uh, resulted in really uh, staggering rates of disproportionality and punitive uh, discipline for our black and brown students. And so uh, the goal of the behavior education plan was a more in inclusive vision of and a more public health approach to uh, behavior in our schools. Now it has not been uh, resourced to the fullest extent possible and the concept of restorative justice hasn't been fully um, you know, bought in yet. And so we, uh, you know, from a principal uh, position on down, um, we really need to um, 
you know, and still more practices and conflict resolution and de-escalation and and a reconciliation as well, because sometimes the response rather than the tr triggering event uh, causes the reach of trust sometimes with students. And, um, sorry, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so our next question is from Amanda Quintana um, at Wisconsin TV News 3. Again, she um, unfortunately couldn't be here. It's definitely a very busy time. Um, or channel three, of course. Um, so Amanda's question says, um, Amanda, who is, um, excuse me, um, let me go to her actual question. <laughs> uh, so the Madison uh, Metropolitan School District is working to change its curriculum to put more of a focus on phonics and the science of reading. Instead of using cueing techniques to encourage beginning readers to guess a word, excuse me, to guess a word. How do you believe the district can best support students and teachers as it rolls out these changes? And we could start with uh, Nikki and go through the regular order. Hi. <clears throat> Very simply, reading is an absolute necessity when you, from, um, when you start school days till third grade, you're learning to read. After that, you're reading to learn. If you don't have a good fundamentals, you are going to be behind. Phonics is something that needs to be the basis of education, but we need a flexible program because not everyone can do phonics. There are some with, with learning disabilities where it doesn't work. There are other disabilities such as dyslexia where phonic learning does work. It depends on the disorder. It depends on the individual. There's not one way to fix it. And so I want a re reading curriculum that is phonics-based, but with the flexibility to try other methods if phonics is not working. All right, next up is Maya. So I've met with um, recently with some people um, regarding the, the science of reading um, and the information that was presented and the things that some research that I've done um, with them, but also individually, I found very compelling. Um, so when we're at, when we're, when, when we're thinking about that curriculum, I think it's important that we really make sure that our teachers have the understanding of what that actually means and what the science of reading really is and, um, and how it's best implemented. Um, I think that that's going to be, um, one of the, the, one of the driving forces on making sure that it's implemented correctly. Um, but also too, um, it's really getting out the mind frame that we only have one way to teach reading um, and only one way is going to work for everyone. Um, I, I truly believe that we, you know, we have, we're going to have to have our blanket reading curriculum, but we also have to be able to Nikki's point, be able to make adjustments where we, where we need to. So I think that the biggest thing is making sure that teachers understand what the science of reading is and really connect with the experts on that. Chris? Yeah, in, in this campaign, I've been talking a lot about the importance of the new K-5 to reading curriculum that the, the district is looking to change over this next year. And I, and I think what's important to note is that it's an investment both in curriculum and in our teachers. And the, the science of reading discussion is a, a national discussion going on right now and, and something that um, the Department of Public Instruction in Wisconsin has recognized as needing change. Um, Carolyn Stanford Taylor has emphasized that uh, a change in um, instruction to include specific phonics is needed and to really look at the science of how students um, learn to read. Um, with any curriculum that we choose, we have to make sure that it is also culturally relevant for students and it does have that flexibility to work with student work for students and that teachers um, can ad ad adjust and adapt um, what they are teaching based on student needs. Davion? Thank you. Yeah, so currently how students are taught to read is um, through a more holistic reading where if a student doesn't know a word, they are encouraged to look at pictures or to uh, look at other words to try and guess what the word is instead of what phonics approaches is uh, to actually understand the, the letters or letter combinations make. Um, my personal 
education experience as someone, as someone with a stutter, when I saw a speech and language therapist, I had to kind of learn the alphabet inside and out and what sounds each letter makes um, uh, in, in order to, you know, uh, forecast when I would have trouble saying a word. And so when we implement this new curriculum that is grounded in science, it is really important that it be led by teacher voice in terms of, um, you know, what materials we purchase, how it's rolled out, um, the, the, the pilots that we choose, um, as well as, you know, uh, family input in terms of is it culturally relevant for our students? Can our students see themselves in that curriculum is of the highest importance? It's got to start, you know, from a grassroots level. There have to be learner communities with teachers to help uh, them under, you know, to help folks understand the science of reading because in a lot of education schools across the country, they're also behind on this. And so um, a, a lot of ways, uh, you know, we're, we have to change our approach to, uh, uh, to teaching reading. And so that has to start at the grassroots level because I think the last thing we need is another top-down initiative from administration. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, let's try and stay within the minute, please. Um, I know we're doing a decent job and it's hard with Zoom, um, but also let me know, maybe um, Sarah, if you can try doing your sound a little bit louder and use the sound um, to indicate when a minute's done, that might help. Awesome. All right, uh, and then Wayne. Yeah, so I pretty much agree with everything that's been said and I really do wanna emphasize uh, on top of that, uh, something that has been already said too, and that is that it's important that whatever curriculum we use, that it, it is uh, culturally relevant, that that is critical for our students, particularly our African American students and students of color that are struggling uh, with reading uh, when they come into school. You know, um, I know it's particularly for black students, uh, they enter school with thousands of words less than white students do. And the reason for that is, is because um, of reading. I mean, I think that uh, the sooner we get books into the hands of our, our parents so that they can read to our kids and, and, and provide that, uh, that engagement is so critical so that when they come to school, they, if they're familiar with words, familiar with phonics, and will have a much better chance of succeeding in reading because if they don't start reading as great level really soon, uh, the chances of their academic success is severely hampered by that. Thank you. All right, so our next question is uh, from Jenny Peek. So go ahead, take it away. Yeah, so just following up on Amanda's question, a large percentage of Madison students are not proficient in reading and the situation becomes even more dire among the district's Black and Latinx students. What specific policies would you support to address these reading scores? And how would you as a school board member ensure that those policies are equitable? Yeah. Let's start with um, Maya and go down the list. So I think that um, it really comes back down to um, making sure that we have um, like access to all day 4K is something that I've been pushing for. And I think that that is the beginning of, um, of it and making sure that we have policies that will be equitable and more so I think that we definitely need to connect more um, and review the policies that we already have, um, but also connect more with um, like teachers and students and um, figure out an administration, but also figure out like what, what is working and what is not working. Um, but then also to make sure that we are able to engage like black students and, the, and also like the, the Black Excellence Coalition um, and the think, the think tank for that on, because they, they definitely have like the more connection with our black and brown students. So making sure that we have them at the table as well when analyzing what best works. Is that serious? It's not loud enough. <laughs> oh, it's not. Turn up as loud as you can, Sarah, probably. <laughs> All right, uh, Chris, go ahead. 
So I think anytime we're talking about the board level, looking at policies and what the district is doing um, and implementing in the schools, it's important to look at, at what policies govern um, what the schools are doing. And that I think would fall under the instructional policies of the district. And then really looking at what plans um, help and what instructional um, design helps um, help schools figure out how to implement something such as reading or math or any of the curricula that they are needing to do in the schools to teach um, to teach students and then figuring out um, how often and what reports should be coming to the board to just to figure out if schools are making progress, um, which schools are, are struggling um, and how we need to adjust that to make sure that that students are all students in every school are getting the instruction that they need in order to be successful. And so we need to make sure that we have um, evaluations and, and metrics and, and feedback from teachers, students, families, um, uh, what's happening in the schools. Yeah, Davion? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, the, the more early we start, the better. Um, our 4K programs have proven to close reading rates for students who go through them. Um, and I think starting earlier, the better, as Wayne alluded to, um, some of our students um, come into school with a word gap. The underlying study for the word gap uh, has been a little debated, um, but I think more broadly, in terms of looking at a test score and context, uh, we should embrace more sociolinguistic diversity within our student population. And so with that sociolinguistic diversity, how do we recalibrate our tests and our test scores? Um, I fully embrace the science-based approach, making sure that we implement a new science-based reading curriculum is really important and supporting um, reading interventions uh, or, you know, re, you know, that's, that's, it's been a debated topic within the district on whether our reading interventions work. I think we have to address some of those issues within the, uh, both at a, a school-based level and at a uh, in, instruction level as well. Uh, Wayne. Yep, so I'm not exactly sure where the district is right now in terms of uh, reading specialists. Uh, and our, our reading recovery program. I think that, uh, you know, the gap that we've referred to here is, uh, in terms of the word gap, is, is significant. And I think a significant factor in terms of why so many of our black and brown kids enter school uh, so far behind in their reading. And so I think that that even, I think, stresses the point even more that's already even said, is that we certainly need to do everything that we can to make sure that we're getting, you know, books, hands, books in the hands of kids early uh, as possible. Uh, stressing uh, early reading intervention, um, those things are going to be critical because as these kids go on in their academic um, in their academic years, the further behind they're going to fall. If they're, not, if they're not, not reading at grade level, um, you know, by the by the fifth grade, uh, their 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 chances of, of academic success are quite limited. So we have to make sure that whatever uh, science-based uh, reading strategies we're implementing. Are, are meeting the, the, the metric in terms of making sure that all of our students are reading at grade level when they should be. Thank you. Our next question is going to be- uh, I never answered. Oh, I am so sorry, Nikki, go ahead. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, um, my issue is one, we need to write policy that specifically works on reading development, not finding other people to write policy for us. Secondly, the board needs to take that on. But also what needs to be done and what I would do on, on the board is focus on reading recovery tutors, focus on creating two separate task force, one on reading, one on math, to try and use our community resources to provide support and to have parents involved in the choosing of culturally relevant curriculum. And the third thing that I would be in, that I would suggest is that I, I think we need to work both in school and after school. I have supported programs that have worked on reading, including Simpson Street. I did support an MOU on that because it involved increasing reading and writing scores and it actually showed results. We need to focus on what shows results and keep working on those items that show promise. Thanks, Nikki, for your support and apologize again for skipping you that time. Um, so yeah, Logan will uh, ask the next question and for a heads up, Chris, you will start this one. 
Hi, all. Um, so a contract for school resource officers, or SROs, includes a June 10th deadline for the board to remove an officer from one of the city's four main high schools. It's a program some view as a contributor to the school to prison pipeline that disproportionately affects students of color, but others see the officers as relationship builders who are vital to the safety of the schools. Would you support a reduction in the number of SROs from four to three and to follow up, if the number of SROs are reduced, how would you determine which school would no longer have an officer? I'll just say I support the school resource officers in our schools. I see them as, as um, staff um, who build relationships with students and with staff in our schools and have the job of de-escalating situations as they arise in the schools and on the school grounds. And that reduces the need for outside law enforcement to be called into our schools. And there have been multiple situations this year that have been safely resolved, um, multiple serious situations that have been safely resolved um, due to the school resource officers and their work. Um, as far as removing an officer, um, I'm, as far as when I have read the contract, um, I, I don't believe that um, the, the school board itself has the, the choice of where that person gets removed from. And so um, I guess I, I would be um, interested in finding out more about that, but I support the school resource officers in our schools. Fabian? Yep, uh, so in the long run, uh, in the long view, I do not support SROs in our schools. Um, however, I think we have to build up a lot of internal capacity to, uh, for restorative justice, so conflict resolution, de-escalation, and, um, and um, uh, reconciliation as well. Um, I think our schools have the resources to do so, but we're not there yet. And so I would support the pilot if a school community thought they were ready for it. I think that we have the building blocks for it. You know, our s security guard, so I'm happy that we are going to reclassify and pay more for the work that they're doing. Uh, do the work, uh, this work every day. They are many times, they are former students, they've been in the schools and they have authentic relationships with students already. Uh, that uh, is, is something that we should leverage and use to our advantage. Um, you know, I, I also think that it is something that we have to embrace restorative justice district wide. Uh, when we talk about school climate and school safety, we have to look at that holistically. Um, and I'm cut off. Wayne. So in full disclosure, I was a former, well, we were EROs back then, and now I guess they're SROs. But, you know, the main reason that I wanted to be an ERO back in the 90s when we first started this program, this collaboration partnership with the, with the district was that it would be a chance for me as a police officer to be in the school to really get to know students. And as I see, uh, and, and the staff, and to be a resource for them, and to, and to protect them if need be. But what I see now, and I've visited, I've had conversations with all four of the current SROs, and they're, they're really doing a good job in our schools. They're, they're building relationships. They're, they're, um, they're preventing a lot of things that could happen um, both in the school and outside the school. And they understand that their role is to, there to be a resource for the students. And um, one of them, at least, has a, is, has a, like me, has two kids that are graduates of the district from La Follette High School. Um, he was anxious to get back into school and work with kids because he re recognizes that everything that we can do to help our kids is, is what we should be doing right now. And I think our SROs are doing a good job of building those relationships and, and helping those students who need that. Thank you. All right, uh, Nikki. Yes, I support removing one officer to go from four to three. The reason I do this and why I voted against the SRO contract, and you, I've said this previously, is I had asked for disability training for especially for nonverbal students as several years ago, there was an autistic student that was removed by EROs from our high schools during an autistic meltdown. I feel that it's, I have to balance the line between my community and the safety of every single student there. I think that using our security officers, like Sabian said, is an excellent idea and that we need to pay them more. 
we need to work on creating relationships, absolutely. But I think that can be done with our security officers. Additionally, I think my view may change if training was provided and if cost was shared. But currently neither, although I advocated for both, neither were in the contract. So therefore, that is the reason for my stance. Maya? So like during this whole campaign, um, people have asked for my yes or no answer. And the way I see it is that it's not a simple yes or no answer. And I think that um, we need to understand that um, there's a lot to consider when making a decision. Um, on the board, I definitely would make certain to do my due diligence um, before any vote is done. Um, this would be you know, definitely standard in the business and nonprofit world. Um, it's also the way I see it is that it's a matter of trust, transparency, um, cost effectiveness. You definitely want to make sure that we have training agreements on special needs and de-escalation techniques, not, you know, just short workshops, but in-depth training. Um, I also think that the ability to provide feedback um, about our SRO's performances is key. Um, and I also think that the ability to request a change in SRO in case of um, like concerns, I think is super important. Um, definitely we need guidelines for when SROs are asked to intervene, you know, training on trauma-informed responses um, for all staff, not just them, um, and also education for students, staff, and teachers on the rights and responsibilities. So I think that, you know, for me, it's definitely has to be a, a um, informed decision, and that is the reason why I can't really answer yes or no. It's that middle of the ground because any instance can can be different, so. Okay, so <clears throat> this next question, we will start uh, with Savion. Simpson Street Free Press and others have questioned whether the school district administration's uh, Black, Excellent Plan, Black Excellence Plan puts enough emphasis on academic achievement. In a report to the school board last month, uh, administrators and some board members acknowledge and address these questions. So as a candidate for the Madison School Board, to what extent do you think our Black Excellence Plan should focus on academics? Um, I think it has to be both an academic, academics, social emotional needs, and a feeling of belonging in a community. Um, a school is a community that a person, a school is the first community that a person joins and they have to be able to see themselves thrive in that community. And that feeling absolutely impacts their academic performance. Their social emotional well-being absolutely impacts their academic performance. And so I think on a school level, there should be school level academic goals determined by a principal in the school community and the school-based leadership team and parent advisory groups. PTOs and student advisory groups as well. Uh, but that has to be, I think, a, a school level choice to focus on what academic measures they want to focus on. Um, but while I agree that there is an emphasis needed um, for academic growth, we also can't uh, undercount the, the importance of social emotional learning and the ability or in the feeling to feel uh, belonged in a community as well. Wayne? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, Black excellence is key, and, I, and, and when I think about black excellence, I, I think that black excellence means excellence for all. And what I mean by that is that currently in our district, and, and for the past uh, several decades now, um, black students have, have been underachieving, underperforming, and under-resourced. And so what this black excellence to me means is that we're going to focus on our, on our, our black children by making them better students and by making our black students who are at least performing students better stu students, that's going to improve the overall academic performance of the district as a whole. And I think what we really need to do, um, there needs to be an academic focus here. There also needs to be um, an asset focus, right? We need to make sure that we're focusing on the positive skills or the good skills that our kids have in school that are bringing and not just focusing on, focusing on the deficit. And that's what, unfortunately, what happens too often with our kids is they're, they're looking at what, what they don't have, the zip code they come from. We need to make sure that we're focusing on our assets as well. 
Nikki, you can go ahead. Um, yes, I think I need to go back to my psychology and sociology class and go back to um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. As much as I hated it in psychology, it's actually needed. Child can't learn if they don't have their basic necessities. That means food. That means the ability to feel safe, comfortable, and supported where they're at. So anything that requires academics, of course, is important. But if we're not starting and making sure our children have their needs met, we're not going to have academic success. A hungry child can't learn. A child who is homeless is going to have learning issues oftentimes. What we need to do is see the whole child, both academic, social, and emotional, and just financial and fiscal as well, and make sure that our kids are getting what they need before we can focus, just laser focus on academics. Again, an academic, when I say academics, I mean general learning. I do not mean a test score. Our students are more than a test score and learning should be measured by more than what's on a map or for an exam. Maya? So I think that um, I definitely echo what someone, some have said already. Um, I think it's key to make sure that our children are not seen as a deficit, but that they are actually seen as um, children who can achieve. Um, as a Black student in Madison schools myself growing up, um, and now as a parent of Black children, I think that, you know, Black excellence, yes, I do agree that at some point we definitely want to make sure that there is some focus on academics. But um, as it's been said, is that you know, for me going through school, it was very isolating in certain classes. It didn't have like culturally relevant um, curriculum. I was in classes where I was the only black kid. Sometimes I didn't feel safe. People wouldn't like want to um, do projects with me and things like that. So um, you definitely start to see my, your, your, yourself and you start to see that your grades go down. So I think that this is something that ha happens a lot with our students and our black children is that they have to feel safe. They have to be emotionally connected to their school. Um, it's definitely something that I've been talking a lot about. Um, and so when we're saying black excellence needs to focus more on academics, they're doing a great job in making sure that children feel connected to their schools. And I think that that is the first key to um, start having success for black children. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, I'm having a problem with the microphone there. Um, I, I agree with uh, a lot of what people have said is that it, it has to go hand in hand, the academics with the social, emotional and students being valued and feeling part of their school community. I, I do think that when students are successful academically, that builds confidence and, and that builds their sense of belonging. And so I think that is an important critical thing. I think the urgency, the, the reading that we talked about earlier and the making sure that we are accelerating students learning in academics and really keeping a focus on that is really important. Um, talking about reading, talking about math. And we do have to change the narrative about students. Um, Black excellence is about recognizing the talent and potential that exists in students and then giving the opportunity and the support to, to grow in their learning and, and grow in um, those academic skills. Because when students get to the end of school, to the end of high school, we want them to be prepared for whatever um, post high school options they choose, whether that's college or career. So uh, this next question is gonna be from Josepha. And uh, Wayne, you can go ahead and start with this response when uh, she's done asking her question. So, Josepha, we can't hear you. Um, I don't know if it's some type of connection issue. Okay, so Josepha, why don't you mute yourself actually and I will just ask your question for you. Okay, sorry about that, Joseph. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, but her question, um, she wanted to actually follow up to um, my question. And so hers is, what will you do to ensure Black excellence and other pro-Blackness programs are supported and integrated into our schools? 
And as we asked in the previous question, do you think our Black Excellence Plan should include concrete and measurable improvements in reading, math, and science? Um, so yeah, a little bit similar, um, but a little bit more into the um, kind of other programs and the funding of them. Yeah, so I, I think that um, it should be incorporated, um, and, and this has been a discussion that we've having we've been having for a long time. Is that you know there aren't enough uh, courses uh, in, in the curriculum that, that pertain to, uh, to to the black culture, and as we've already alluded to, uh, it is absolutely critical that that students see themselves in the curriculum. So if they don't um, see that, that that uh, increases their lack of engagement and they're not learning. And so kids need to see themselves in the curriculum. So I would, I would be in support of, of, of um, incorporating that into the curriculum and not just making some of those courses electives, but making them uh, requirements uh, that, that kids learn about you know, Black history, and, you know, not just during Black Hist History Month. And so I would certainly push for funding, uh, make sure that we've got policies in place that are uh, addressing the issue of, of uh, making sure that we have uh, African-centered pedagogy, that we have culturally relevant curriculum that pertains to Black excellence uh, throughout the curriculum, because I think that's where it should be. Okay. All right. Uh, Nikki. Um, yes. My view is Black excellence should be woven in the curriculum. I know what it's like not to be seated curriculum. I didn't see another disabled individual in my in my materials till I saw Helen, except for Helen Keller. So I was 14 years old and found out Wilma Rudolph actually had polio and a club foot. I had no idea that individuals with disabilities could and did achieve. And it did make me lack of, the lack of connection did affect me. We need to have people relate to that material. This is best done by having individuals from the community, from the African-American community, to stress what is important. Because I can't make that decision as a individual who is not of color. That decision must be made by members of the community as a whole. As for the money, I think very simply, we need to focus on funding black student unions and after school programs, as well as um, creating mentors for all students. Thank you. Right. Uh, Maya? Yeah. So. I've been actually part of um, the Black Excellence um, groups that have been going on for a while now, since it, actually since it started in the capacity as a parent. Um, and something that I think is super important to understand is that the Black Excellence is broader than the goal three, which basically focuses on um, black, um, like black reading and um, math scores. And so it definitely is important to understand that difference um, and that, you know, yes, we can say that we can build in more, um, like more goals to reach academics, but that is the point of goal three. And I think black excellence definitely supports that. Um, if I was, if I am elected to the board, I think that we definitely need to make sure that we have more teachers of color, that we have um, more curriculum that is culturally relevant and really focus on the mastery of um, of the curriculum and not necessarily just you know um, memorizing. Um, I think that we definitely need to understand that you know black um, black history is not something that is only done on February. It's done throughout the year and really weaving it into the actual curriculum. So I mean, those are definitely some things that I think are important, and I would definitely try to champion, including BSU's citywide and um, and such. So, Chris. Taylor, can you repeat the question again? I feel like I missed the first part of the question. Yes. Um, so what will you do to ensure Black excellence, BSUs, and other pro-Blackness programs are supported and integrated into our schools? And as we asked in the previous questions, do you think our Black excellence plan uh, should include concrete and measurable improvements in reading, math, and science? Yeah, I, I think having it called out in our strategic for, framework as a specific goal, Black excellence is really important. And our new superintendent has noted that that, that was um, something unique, he thought, among school districts and really important to continue the work around that. I think Maya's point about how the, the goals um, in the strategic framework and the Black Excellence Coalition overlap and support each other is really important. Um, I do 
believe that we need to make sure that we are looking when we're talking about black excellence, we're looking at those academic metrics and the specific strategies that we're going to use um, to make sure that we are accelerating learning um, for our students and then also looking at community partners and how we are going to work with um, groups like Simpson Street Free Press that are providing academic programs after school and in the summer um, to continue student learning. So um, looking at community partners and, and how they can support that work too. All right, uh, see you again. I think it was a famous hip hop artist who said that make black history every day. I don't eat a month. Um, but, you know, I think when we talk about embracing it in the curriculum and instruction, it has to be something that we live and breathe every day. Um, it, and that means that it's not just an additional bullet point in a lesson plan. Uh, it really has to be something that we live and breathe every day. Uh, when I had the chance to help teach a 1619 project at O'Keefe Middle School. Um, it's innovative ideas like that, uh, allowing teachers to operate within some autonomy and to take, uh, try to think outside the box, because in a lot of ways that's unheard of in a classroom in America. Uh, we need to fully support our BSUs. I've worked with the high school BSUs and forming a citywide one, um, and am really proud to support um, the, the pilots for our middle schools. And we need to look down to the elementary level as well. We need to support uh, our four pilot community schools as well because they offer a new type of uh, public school where there's more voice for parents. Um, and then we need more black and brown teachers. I think it's a shame that out of 27 out of 32 schools serving third through fifth graders, 27 of them do not have a single black teacher. Um, that's unacceptable and something that uh, I commit to changing on the board. Thank you. All right. Um, so this next question, we will start with Nikki. Reading scores in Madison are historically low. According to the Capital Times and Wisconsin State Journal and the Wisconsin DPI, only 10.1% of black students and 16% of Hispanic students score proficient or advanced in English um, slash language arts on recent statewide forward exams. Because classroom teachers only have limited time during the school day for one on one reading instruction, more and more education researchers point to the importance of out of school time opportunities for students. If elected to the Madison School Board, how will you support academics based partnerships with out of school time community partners. I think that's a very important issue. Currently on the board, I've already um, started my work in this area when I created a MOU between Simpson Street and the um, district because, I, again, I like the reading and writing focus. Additionally, what I would do, and to, I want to increase that, I would like to work with the Black student unions directly. I want to make sure that people feel, have that connection. And could you repeat the question one more time? Oh, yeah. Um, so, um, I, I read a couple stats, um, and I'll just say it one more time, but 10% of black students um, and 16% of Hispanic students score proficient um, or advanced in English and language arts. So the question is, if elected to the Madison School Board, how will you support academic-based partnerships with out-of-school time community partners? I would also focus and create out-of-school times that combine both academics and social emotional learning. I think most our partnership with most has to be changed in a way that we can do both after school and social emotional bonding. And that right now, I think we're focusing only on one area and we need to focus on both. Additionally, working more with black student unions and going into the community and asking parents, what is helpful for your child? Asking the students themselves, what, what works what helps you to retain material? Because teaching to the test isn't working. Focusing on, we need to raise our math scores isn't enough. Our students deserve more than that. Maya. So um, I think that definitely, like I worked for the Boys and Girls Club and we worked directly with um, the schools when, um, when our students came in in after school programs. Um, and I definitely was a, a leader, an academic leader, like like for almost like 10 years um, in different roles. Um, but definitely um, that's something that I definitely wanna make sure that we get more investment in ways from our community partners. 
Um, that includes, I remember when Simpson Street Free Press actually was started for um, the South Side as well and the kids that lived in the neighborhood. Um, and so it's like working with those organizations, working with other, um, the BSUs, definitely. I was one of the <laughs> people in BSU when it started at West, but it's really trying to engage um, our students and our community organizations. Um, and that's something that I definitely have prioritized um, a lot in, um, in during this campaign. So that's something I really wanna focus on getting more investment um, from our organizations um, and, and leverage that more in our schools, especially after school. Chris? I'll say again that I think the, the partnerships that we have um, with out of school time providers are, are really important for supporting and um, continuing to accelerate learning for students. Um, the Simpsons 3 Free Press, again, as an example, um, is a great opportunity for students after school um, and um, during the summer to continue to build academic skills, um, no matter what level they start at. I think one of the things we have to talk about is capacity issues and what barriers there might be to students participating. You know, do we have the capacity to support um, the, the number of students that need to be supported in this way out of school? And so how do we port partner with more organizations to make sure that, that we are meeting students' needs and connecting with families um, to keep the learning going in the summer and out of school. Okay, Vian, you can go ahead, please. So, um, you know, we should definitely evaluate and ch champion the partnerships that we have right now. A lot of folks have mentioned Simpson Street Free Press, but also Avitops and People Program, Odyssey Project are all other, um, uh, after school partnerships in which we see success, you know, we should look for opportunities where those can be scaled and, 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 and replicated in other, um, other partnerships as well. Uh, the school district has two, um, two um, uh, national demonstration schools for avid tops, which is something to be proud of. Um, going forward, I am really interested in looking at partnerships at the elementary and even 4K level as well to specifically focus on reading. Um, and to answer a component of the prior question is, you know, I do support academic uh, goals or metrics that we should achieve, but it should come from the school level. Um, I think that there should be, you know, a, a broader district wide level goals that we wanna hit, but I think uh, fundamentally they gotta be at the school level. Uh, Wayne. So, yeah, so I think that those um, uh, just really uh, terribly low reading scores that you mentioned earlier uh, uh, among Black and, and Latinx students uh, are really a direct result, again, of the fact that we're not getting our, our kids to read early enough. And I really think that, um, that reading does begin in the home so that when kids get to the school, they are uh, much more on, on a grade level than if they did not or if they had not had any exposure uh, while they were at home. And so one of the things that uh, for, for the partnerships, I agree we need to expand those, scale them up. Uh, one of the uh, groups I'm a member of, 100 Black Men of Madison, we have a, um, a project store that we partnership collaboration with the district that began a few years ago. We're going into schools, uh, working with students uh, on a variety of things, but we really do emphasize the reading because we firmly believe that reading is fundamental. And if kids can't read, um, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So we feel it's a critical piece of the educational process. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so the next question is from Jenny Peek, um, and we can have Maya start this one. So Madison schools are currently out of session per the Evers administration stay at home mandate with some ambiguity and little end in sight to the current situation. How would you as a school board member work to ensure Madison students are still learning while school is out? And what can the board and district do to provide parents with assistance during this time? So I am one of those parents. Um, all of my children go to Lincoln. Um, and so, you know, I was actually still working last week um, in office. And um, so I feel as though that the response um, that the district has done actually was a pretty positive response. You know, the first two days before 
um, the closure was supposed to happen definitely was helpful, at least for me and some other parents, because they were able to look for, um, for child care or look for someone to watch their kids um, while they could work. Um, I think that the survey that just came out last week, or actually yesterday, um, to ask children or parents if their child had access to internet and, and Chromebooks, like my kids teachers have been calling every day, just talking with my kids. And so I think, you know, the district can definitely like make the push of, you know, we need to do this, make sure that kids have um, their devices or have devices. Um, but at the same time, the teachers, I, I, I really have a heartfelt thing for the teachers. They definitely have been reaching out and making sure that at least kids are reading and doing things that might not um, be part of like online learning. Um, so I think that those are important parts to the online part, so. Chris? Um, this has just been a really challenging and stressful time um, for everyone. And obviously the important part is prioritizing health and safety to start. Um, Community-wide response um, has been great. And I think um, specifically for, for Madison's students, it's gonna be important going forward to continue really good communication um, between schools and teachers and families um, about what resources that, that students can access us and and what the expectations are going to be moving forward and making sure that that students and families have access to the information they need that they have access to the the devices and the connections that they need um, once we decide what type of online learning or how learning is going to work going forward um, for students i have a high school student and so i i'm going to be looking forward to the direction that's going to be received um, in the next week and i think giving the teachers in the district a week um, to figure this out after spring break is really important and just knowing that our teachers and staff are going to need a lot of support to transition to um, what we're going to provide online is really important to recognize too. Vivian? So this has been a very challenging and demanding and in some ways traumatic situation for our entire community and country. Um, you know, in terms of supporting online learning for uh, the duration while we're out of school, we have to be really mindful, thoughtful, and compassionate about the equity issues that there are with online learning. Um, it is an issue that is complicated and demanding for students with special needs. It's uh, complicated for students who need in-person support. Um, and we really have to be mindful about that. You know, our school should absolutely be a resource for families who are still seeking learning. Um, but we have to be really mindful about the inequities that exist in home for students. A lot of students are still struggling for food, for a reliable place to sleep, for a safe place to be at. Um, and we just have to be really mindful about that. Um, you know, we'll see how long, it's a very fluid situation, we'll see how long the situation goes. Um, but, you know, especially for seniors, we, we gotta work something out, um, but yeah. Did we lose Wayne? Yeah, it looks like we lost Wayne. Hopefully, um, I think Shoko's going to help him get back on. We should move on and maybe um, toward the end, we'll have him answer that question um, if he wants. Okay, then I, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having Ben contact Wayne. Okay. Yep, so we'll work on it. Okay. All right, Thank Nikki, you. over to you. Thank you. Um, very simply, this is an incredibly stressful time. There are two ways that we're really need to focus on. One is equity. Not everyone has access to internet, like Savian said, but two, for individuals with special needs who have IEPs, this is going to be very, very difficult to get goals and achievements back, especially when there's talk of, uh, during the COVID relief bill, of removing IDEA, the laws that uh, govern the ability for individuals with disabilities to attend school to be suspended for one year was one of the plans and that could derail public education quite a bit. Additionally, what we, the district needs to do, in my opinion, we need to focus on pass fail options. I don't think the student should be punished for a situation that they can't control. In this case, there are many ways to learn. 
you want a biology or an ecology lesson, go out for a walk, list four different kinds of leaves, list the different kind of trees you see. Those are different creative ways. The other way and the most important, the other thing is, besides supporting our teachers and staff, how we support them best, we make sure that they're paid for the duration, and that includes substitute teachers, and that includes not just substitute teachers, but hourly workers, so they're not worrying about if they're going to get paid while they're trying to teach our kids. All right. Thank you, Nikki. Um, our next question is going to be from Leilani McNeil. Actually, Wayne's back. Oh, sorry. Wayne, are you back and ready to answer a question? I, Wayne, we can hear you. Can you hear us? This is Shoko. You can. Okay, great. Okay. I can't have connection problems. So sorry about that. It's okay. Um, so Wayne, would you, I, I can't remember if you dropped off before or after I, uh, Jenny asked the question. Do you want to hear it again? Yes, please. All right. Sorry about that. One That's second. Okay. Um, so Madison's, just give me one moment. Sorry. <laughs> um, so Madison schools are currently out of session per the Evers administration stay at home mandate with uh, some ambiguity about when this will end. How do you as a school board member work to ensure Madison students are still learning while school is out and what can the board and district do to provide parents with assistance during this time. Uh, I know that, um, you know, there are some groups that are trying to work together to get, you know, make sure that we have laptops, that each kid has a laptop at home, that if, uh, you know, they've got a teacher that's doing some online teaching, that, that they can engage in that. Um, I know that uh, some of the teachers are uh, reaching out to their students, uh, you know, just to show a sign of support. Um, but I really think, though, that uh, given the, the current circumstances we're under that, um, you know, if, if kids have, you know, parents in the home or a parent in the home that, you know, that, that's a good time to work with their students on um, various activities uh, and maybe not just all academic, but just spending time together as a family and, and doing some academic stuff, but, you know, reading and writing and practicing those skills uh, for our younger students in particular. Um, I think that's very important. So as a board member, I would certainly push for making sure that we have um, uh, that we can provide uh, in these situations like this um, resources to our staff and students so that they can continue the learning process while a school is uh, out of session. Great. Thank you and thanks for everybody for being flexible during connection issues and everything. Uh, so yeah, we're going to have Leilani ask her question and then Chris, you can start this one off. Okay. Recent news reports called attention to the grading floor practices being used at my school, Madison West High School. The school's principal and district administrators defended these policies, saying they can help students remain engaged at school. Around the country, however, many education professionals shun the use of grade floors because these policies can lead to lower expectations for students of color. If elected, what position will you take on using grading floor tactics? Thanks for this question. I would actually like to find out more information and receive a report to the board on what exactly what the grading floor practices are and how widely they are being used um, in the different high schools. And um, again, the intent behind them and um, basically the, the metrics that are being used to decide if they are working um, for their intended purpose or not. Um, I, I, I understand the concept behind it because if students get too far behind in, in some of their classes, there's no way to catch up after a certain point. Um, but I am concerned that um, the potential for lowering academic um, expectations um, that could happen with this practice as well. And so I would, I would want that to come before the board so that the board has um, accurate information on how widely this is being used and um, how the decision was made to use it and how to measure um, how that's working going forward or, or the reasons for using it. Say again? So 
This is a complicated one. And I think the, it's really important that we keep these decisions uh, contextually. Um, in general, I do support the use of grade floors because there may be students who are disengaged, um, uh, but have a concept mastered. So, uh, you know, in, in education, there is the qualitative assessment where, you know, for some assignments, you might lose, what, five percentage points for every day that it's late. If there is a student who is disengaged and not bought in, but has mastered a concept, I don't think that they should necessarily fail a course because they were late on one big assignment um, where even if they complete the rest of the coursework on time and show mastery, they might still uh, fail the course because at that particular time they weren't necessarily engaged. So I think it, it, it is a, um, uh, a, you know, an, a strategy to keep engagement for students to stay engaged within classes. However, you know, as, as you said, we really have to ward off against the bigotry of low expectations for our black and brown students. Uh, Nick, you can go ahead. Or, uh, excuse me, Wayne. <laughs> I think Wayne's next, sorry. Okay, no, that's fine. Uh, so I, I am, I'm concerned about anything that lowers expectations for our students in particular. So I would really have to look more closely at that in terms of looking at the data and the information on the grade flooring. But um, it reminds me of something that happened when I was a student at O'Claire uh, back in the 70s. They implemented a plus minus system, which you didn't have before. And they did that because of grade inflation. And what it did was Wayne, we can't hear like the last academic GP or had low GPAs, it put them below the can you come back to me please? I'm sorry, I'm having some technical difficulty here. Are you, yep. are you, can you guys hear me at all now? Now we can. Okay. All right, so sorry about this. So, um, so I'm really concerned here about the concept of the self fulfilling prophecy, right? Did it go out again? Can you hear me now? No, yeah. we can. Okay. Um, so I'm really concerned about the concept of the self fulfilling prophecy. We know that students achieve at the level they're expected to achieve. Uh, high expectations mean, uh, mean high achievement, lower expectations, of course, mean lower achievement. So I want to make sure that uh, wherever we're engaging our students, that we're expecting the, uh, the best of them so that uh, they can be successful. Thank you. All right, Mickey, go ahead now. Yes. Very simply, on grade floors, as, as a group, the disabled have unfortunately had to put up with grade floors for quite a time of what, we, what people assume we're capable of. That's the part of the grade floors that I can never agree with. I don't believe in self-fulfilling prophecies. I don't believe in low expectations. I don't believe in setting those people up for those expectations by giving them the quote easier road, quote unquote, or unfortunately what I've heard court is graduating via IEP, which is a term I hope to never hear again personally, because very simply an IEP does not mean lesser education. It, you should have the same type of challenges, just modifications based on disability, not based on assumption. Therefore, I would be against grade four. Uh, Maya. So I think that, um, again, just kind of piggybacking off of what Savion and Nikki both said, I think that it's really important um, that we understand um, how it's being used, but then also too, and we don't want to use it as a way that will um, disenfranchise like black and brown students further um, in using it as a way to um, see children as a like a deficit um, way. But I think that, you know, like to Nikki's point about IEPs and such, you know, my son is on an IEP and we definitely need to make sure that um, his educational and academics are um, like there's modifications each year that he goes through um, school. But um, as a whole, I think it's just important to understand those, those the contextual part, as Savion has said, um, and understanding that there are children um, who may have the mastery, but may not, um, like Savion said, engaged in, in, in school. Um, so I think that though all those parts are important to um, think about as a board member um, in actually going through with these um, decisions on grade fours. Thanks. 
All right, this next question will be from Scott and we will uh, start with Savion. Uh, so the Madison School District is currently facing a lawsuit for allegedly not responding to a series of anonymous open records requests and has faced criticism for transparency concerns from some in the community. Uh, with what importance do you view Wisconsin open meeting rules and open records laws? And how important do you believe it is for the school district to follow uh, those laws and respond to open records requests in a timely manner? So, yeah, I yeah, I think that we should absolutely follow the law. Um, and I think that we should um, uh, respond to open records requests in a timely manner. However, you know, a school board is a board of governance kind of unlike uh, many others and that we have to deal with student privacy laws and employee privacy laws as well that, you know, pro prohibit what we can divulge to the public. Uh, with um, respect to transparency and by extension accountability, you know, in my time on the board, I've observed a lot of uh, antiquated practices with regard to those issues. And, you know, I think that we should have a citizen task force on how to improve transparency and engagement with the, the school board and, and school district. Um, I think that, you know, it should be impaneled and, uh, you know, give us a list of 12 recommendations on ways we can do better um, and we should uh, embrace them. Thanks. Wayne, go ahead. Yeah, so um, there was a time when the district did have what was called the communications committee. Um, it was a subcommittee of the board uh, that I served on back in uh, about 2006 to 2008. That was the main thing that we were responsible for was, was uh, getting communication out to parents about what was happening within the district. And, um, you know, as I've gone around and talked to different people, um, about the district's transparency, that is a concern that a lot of people have, that they don't feel that it's transparent enough. And so I think that... Hello? We can, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great, I, okay. As a board, I think we need to be as transparent as, as possible and follow the laws of the open records quest. Thank you. Uh, Nikki. I think you already know the answer to the, uh, my answer to this question, but I'm going to go give it a shot anyway. Very simply, transparency is the most important job this district has. We don't follow the open records law as well as we could, and I'll openly admit that. As an attorney, that scares me. It's something we need to do. I like uh, Sabian's idea of a citizen task force. I think it's an excellent one. I think it would provide necessary accountability. I know we don't follow open meetings requests because I'm still waiting on one from July in which I asked about uh, the school store. It still, uh, it still hasn't been um, filled and that was uh, July uh, 7th when I filed it. So I know we don't follow them. Um, and that is unfortunate. We, our relationship in the community is based on trust. It's based on transparent actions. You can't trust something you can't see. And, and right now we're not providing that. Additionally, I'm afraid it'll get worse if we hire someone which we're currently discussing to possibly write our own policy and to be told the board has no right to vote on it because it's under $20,000 is just another way that uh, administration is lacking transparency. And that's something I'm quite concerned about as a board member and will be whether I'm on or off the board. Maya? So working for the Department of Revenue, we go through extensive um, training when it comes to open um, records uh, laws and extensive training on how to respond to open records and working with the secretary's office and such. So, you know, definitely working there for the, for since I started, you know, I've had um, interactions with doing that. Um, I think that the position as a board member is definitely, as um, Nikki has said, is about trust, it's about accountability, uh, transparency, but also to, to Savion's point, um, which I also agree with, is that um, we have to make sure that we are doing them in a timely fashion and that we are um, making sure that we respond to them along, while we are making sure that we are following the laws for privacy, for our, our students and um, in those in our teachers that are involved in that. So I think that, you know, it's definitely, um, we have to do it, um, but it's, it's two sides of the coin um, when it comes to actual open records laws. It's also the other parts of it 
uh, for students and privacy laws with teachers and such. Um, as a board member, I would want to ensure that the board and the public have access to accurate and timely information um, to inform decision making. Um, I think that whether we're talking about the budget or hiring processes or um, who's going to be writing policies, instructional material choices, evaluations of how our schools are doing, we need good information to make good decisions and the, the public has to have access to that so that they can participate if we really want people to engage. Um, what we do and what we discuss and the information that we have has to be um, available. I have done um, multiple open records requests specifically around the Office for Civil Rights Resolution um, at, the, at the high school level um, to um, allow students ac access um, to in preparation for advanced coursework. And that is something that um, was dealt with at the district level. The advisory committee that was working on that didn't have access um, to the information that was going back and forth between the district and the Office for Civil Rights. And I just think it's important um, to, to figure out where that information flow needs to happen and um, how we make sure that it's done in a timely and transparent way. All right, and Logan has the next question, and um, we will, um, sorry, I'm losing my order. Who are we starting with again? <laughs> Start with Savion, I think, Thank right? <laughs> yep. Okay, so um, in recent years, there have been protests at some board meetings, largely about whether to have police in schools. Uh, at times, the protests have disrupted further board proceedings either requiring the board to move into a room close to the public to finish its agenda or cancel the rest of the meeting. As a board member, how would you maintain the First Amendment rights of district residents at board meetings while ensuring the board is able to conduct the public's business in an open environment? I think we are starting with you, Savion. Uh, I started the last one. Oh, you're right. Okay, so Wayne, you're starting with you. All right, so I think it's important that everybody's voice is heard. And, you know, I hear, uh, you know, in, in my travels around the city and talking to pe different people in the district, uh, there's some real great concerns about that, the fact that our, our, our meetings are interrupted like that. I think that um, we need to, as a board, figure out how we can uh, have more orderly meetings. I certainly uh, think it's important that everybody's voice is heard, whether or not you agree with their viewpoint or not. And I think that that's the issue that we have is that, you know, just because we have differences of agreement doesn't mean that we can't disagree disrespectfully and there are dis, dis, uh, disagree respectfully. There is, you know, uh, a way to go about doing that. And, and I see that these disruptions um, are not a part of what the democratic process is all about. And that is that every person should be able to express their points of view uh, without fear of intimidation, without fear of harassment, without fear of being threatened. And that's, I think it's, we're, we're you know, encroaching some dangerous territory when people don't feel that they want to come to a meeting and express their viewpoint. I think as a board, we have a responsibility to make sure everybody's voice is heard. Thank you. All right, uh, Nikki. I don't believe in a heckler's veto, which is shouting down the speaker. However, in a public forum, I believe people have the right to speak. Yes, the board has very important business to do. I believe in live streaming when necessary, but I don't believe we have the right to stop the protesters. If we look at um, case law, both Shank versus the United States, which talks about the uh, shouting fire falsely at a crowded theater. Brandenburg, which openly states that you, it must be a clear and present danger, and followed by um, the uh, the case in which you stay, in which you do not give up your rights at the schoolhouse door. Very simply, people have to have the right to speak. So, I my solution is very simple: have forums, have where people can discuss it outside the school board meeting, but with the board in a publicly noticed forum so that the issues can be aired or ask for the legislature or the um, state to do uh, for a recommendation on whether or not the board should be allowed to answer back. The fact that the board must sit there while the other group yells at them 
create the charged atmosphere. I think if we could create an actual open dialogue that we can hear both sides of the story and still preserve the right to speak. Maya? Yeah, so I, um, this question came up the other day in which I definitely um, was misrepresented um, in the words that I said. Um, so I just want to just make sure that I clear that you know, what I said was definitely that my voting rights and for me to actually be able to um, run for school board was based off of civil disobedience. Um, and so it's really, you know, it's a public forum, we are a public uh, meeting, um, protesting, if it happens, we definitely have to respect the rights of protest. Um, and that is what um, I said. What I don't agree is, you know, getting in faces and things of that nature um, that create go going into people's personal space, um, you know, but definitely to Nikki's point, we definitely have to be more creative in how do we engage our students um, and those that are protesting. Um, and so I just wanted just to make that clear um, again, my voting rights were able to be here because of my grandma fought for them. She marched on that. Um, other people marched on that. And so um, protesting is a part of the democracy, but we also want to make sure that we engage um, everyone um, inclusively. And so maybe the public forums, um, to Nikki's point, are, is, a good, is a good idea in finding ways that we can work with um, others outside of the, the, the meetings. Okay, Chris. Every, every board meeting um, that is publicly noticed um, and these, the board meetings should have time for public appearances. It's the time when the board members get to hear from the public their concerns and um, the opinions of, of, of the public and and people who are engaged in our schools and so i i strongly support keeping um the right of people to to come to school board meetings and speak everybody gets a three minute time slot to speak and um, share their opinions with the board on the topics on the agenda um as far as the disruptions at at the board meeting sure anyone has found a good solution on how to do that yet um, and but I think we have to find a way to have a constructive dialogue in our community around this issue um, it's really important so that we can move forward on a lot of um, issues that the board needs to deal with and a lot of really important work that needs to get done and so we have to find a constructive way forward go ahead say again yep so uh, I believe in the spirit of civil disobedience and the spirit of agitating for change um, you know towards the end of his life a young activist asked Frederick Douglass how do you uh, continue to fight for freedom and he said to agitate 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 and so sometimes you get made uncomfortable in situations uh, with respect to moving board business along during public meetings um, I think you know protest is necessary, it's demanded, and that we should also improve relationships or work on relationships. And you know, we might have to look at implementing some rules of decorum. So folks do respect personal space and everyone can be made, uh, can feel safe. You know, there's a difference between feeling safe and feeling uncomfortable uh, by a truth that you're hearing. And we have to respect and listen to all truth set board meetings and public appearances. So um, I embrace protests, but I think we got to look at some rules of decorum uh, so everyone can feel safe. Thank you. All right. Uh, so this next question, we will have uh, Nikki start. <clears throat> so following up on uh, several previous questions, what else will you do as a school board member to focus on Madison's reading crisis? And to what extent does the Madison reading crisis contribute to Madison's persistent achievement gaps? Um, and then what specific policies will you support that will address Madison's low reading scores? I know those are a lot of questions, um, but feel free to answer it in whatever way you want um, regarding the only if you have one minute. Ma so. Madison reading scores definitely attribute to the achievement gap, without a doubt. Our students, are learning to read instead of reading to learn. This is putting them at an absolute disadvantage. 
and that's not okay to have black and brown students to, and to be the worst in the nation on the achievement gap for black and brown students and close to the worst on students with disabilities is unacceptable. It needs to be changed. Things that I would support, providing tutors, providing actual access to individual writing courses, regardless of age or grade level, to teach people how, create a, create a I also am for creating a culturally relevant um, reading curriculum and providing reading and math task force, but especially in reading task force, built with professionals, teachers, students, and parents, not handpicked. So that way we can find out what's really going on in our schools and what's really working. But I'm going to need you to repeat the first part again, because I think I got two and three, but I think I missed one. Uh, the first part was, um, I, you got the first part. Um, what else will you do as a school? Oh, what teacher? else? Um, what, that's the other, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what else I plan to do, it's very simply, I want to create, I have, my personal opinion, I'd like to create more advanced classes and provide our black, black, brown, and underrepresented students with the knowledge and teaching ability so that those classes are considered a necessity instead of an elective. I think that not providing those skills, we're giving something to work for, and we're not providing those skills, and I think that's hurt our students. Maya? Um, so one thing that I found was very interesting when at a recent um, Black Excellence uh, meeting um, was that when we look at our Black students, um, it looks like from 2019 to 2020 of the 349 students um, that were identified as Black, 42 of those students were um, English language learners. And so it was the first time, uh, or English is their second language. Um, so that's something I think that is super important for us to also realize that it's not just, you know, um, Black American students, but also students who may not know English as a first language. Um, but it's also the way I feel is that, you know, reading is not the only issue. Um, there's a host of other issues that are part of that that create that uh, academic achieve or the 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 achievement gap. Um, it's also too we need more staff, and we definitely need to have have smaller classrooms where we are able to have more one on one time. And so it's really the investment um, in more staff and um, creating a smaller classroom. So that's definitely something that I want to work on. Um, I am a champion for all day 4K, and I think that that is a great equalizer, is getting our children early um, and teaching them early and getting them to read early. So that's something. Chris? I agree that there's an urgency in this work um, around the reading crisis. Um, we need to make sure that students are, are prepared um, and able to access um, the curriculum and learning as they move through our schools. Um, starting very early, like Maya said, with all day 4K, um, making sure that um, the elementary curriculum and instruction um, that we're using is focused on the science of reading and what students need to really build those foundational skills and whatever supports that they need, whether they are an English language learner, whether they are um, a student with a disability, disability, um, all of that needs to, the supports for that need to um, factor into, into what we're doing at the middle school and the high school level. We need to make sure that the instruction that we're providing is relevant and rigorous to our students um, so that they are engaged in their learning. And if their learning needs to be accelerated and supports need to be given along the way, we need to figure out how to do that effectively. And then of course, we need to make sure that we are partnering with community partnerships um, to support learning during the school day, after school, and during the summer too. David? Yeah, so there is absolutely a reading crisis in Madison and in a lot of ways across the state and country. Um, as a school board member, you know, I'm looking to find partnerships for a high quality early childhood education wherever possible, whether it be from birth to three to 4K, because we know that what happens in a child's life for anyone's life from zero to five is the most important part of uh, window of growing uh, any person's brain. 
Um, so I will always champion that. Uh, we'll look to see where we can scale our DLI programs because research shows that uh, when you know, students are learning two languages at a, at a young age, it increases the capacity for a language acquisition for any learner. Um, and then, you know, getting the reading K-5 reading curriculum right um, and pushing students for, for rigor at the secondary level and supporting uh, our reading interventions at the secondary level. Um, and can't emphasize it enough, hiring more black and brown teachers in the district. Yeah. And uh, Wayne, can you hear us, there you go. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So yes, yeah, so I agree with everything that has been said pretty much, and there's not a whole lot else to say about that. But I think though that getting the kids early uh, before they get to school is critical, and making sure that when they do get to school, they're um, you know we, we're meeting them where they are. Uh, there are some prisons in the country that are building uh, building prisons around third grade test scores. Because what they know is that if a student is not reading at um, grade level by the third grade, that each year they're going to become more and more disengaged and they're going to end up eventually end up dropping out. And we know what happens to kids after they drop out of school. So we want to make sure that um, whatever curriculum we're using, uh, that we're engaging our students, meeting them where they are, and uh, using a variety of resources to do that. Community. Uh, you know, different uh, groups, volunteer groups, scaling up our SEA so that they're more than just behavior interventionists, but so that but they're actually that they can actually engage students in in in, um, in, in an academic uh, um, way uh, are things that are going to be critical for the success of these students in the long run. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question is going to be from Jenny. I just want to give you guys a little check to where we are. We actually have three more questions and one, and that includes the closing remarks. So we're getting toward the end. Uh, so Jenny, you can go ahead and then I would say um, we will have Maya start this one. Mm -hmm. So there will likely be two possible referenda on November's ballot a $317 million capital referendum and a $33 million operating referendum. Why are those referenda important for the district's operations and how would you as a member of the school board explain that importance to our local taxpayers? And Maya, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think that is super important, especially when we're thinking about um, our, uh, the building of the new school. Um, and uh, in the Moreland Road area, and those kids are bused way too far and they definitely need their own school. Um, I think that um, making sure that we update our high schools are super important. I went to West High School and it's pretty much almost the same from when I was there in 2000, in, before 2006. Um, and you know, I think that it's important that we get more, uh, make sure that we invest more um, in the referendum because um, it one of the so I was part of some of the meetings for um, the operations and budget uh, meetings for getting ready for the referenda um, and it was one of the things that are coming out of it is the pilot program for all day 4k so I think that if we can get taxpayers to understand that this investment is needed and that as long as we are able to be accountable and have transparency and have actual things in place um, and explain them in depth that in the long run it would actually work for all of our kids and so that's important chris yeah i think it's going to be really important to communicate um, we're asking the the um, community for a significant investment in our Madison schools with these two um, referenda. The, the building referendum, really important for upgrading all four of our comprehensive high schools. Um, they, they, this hasn't been, been done before and the investment is needed to make sure that our learning spaces are, are um, more than adequate. Um, they need to be um, innovative and um, supportive of the learning that needs to go on in our high schools for preparing students for their post high school options. Um, the, the new school on the south side of Madison, I'll, I'll agree with Maya on that, is needed to make sure that we are in investing and in, in making sure that, that students aren't having to um, travel the long distances in order to be engaged in their school. Um, for the operating referendum, really important so that 
that we can maintain our staffing levels and make sure that we are investing in the strategic equity projects that we have placed a really high importance on. Um, and that includes the reading curriculum, All Day 4K, and um, another, a number of other um, equity strategies that are really important going forward. Savian? Yeah, so, you know, in order for Madison to thrive, our public schools have to thrive, whether it be for uh, families and kids or for our economy and, and business leaders in the area to have a well-educated, well-rounded workforce. Uh, and quite frankly, on the, on, on, on the building side, our buildings have fallen behind our neighboring districts. Um, our, you know, what this, upper, uh, what this facilities referendum will do is completely renovate our buildings uh, that haven't seen that renovation in nearly you know, four or five decades. So they are more uh, e e e e ecologically sustainable and meet the needs of students for learning in the 21st century. Uh, moreover, the uh, facilities referendum will include things like uh, rooms for, for mindfulness for students to address social emotional needs and a whole lot more, as Maya has said, uh, the real necessity out of, you know, uh, providing a good education for that neighborhood on the south side of Madison and on the operating side it is very important that we are able to pay our staff and give the full COLA steps and lanes increases um, and also uh, continue to invest in our strategies uh, to close the achievement gap in the district as well um, and so it is well worth the investment for Madison to make in our public schools and our students and educators. Wayne? I think, you know, it's going to be real important that we, uh, that we're able to convince the taxpayers uh, that we are going to be good stewards over their money, that we're not going to uh, make any rash or, or, or rational decisions about how the money is spent. Uh, we may not even need to spend all of it, but I think both referenda are critical. Um, there are a lot of competing school districts outside of Madison that are very appealing to parents. And so I think it's going to be critical for us to make sure that our, our facilities are up to par. Um, one of the things I like about the facilities uh, referendum is that it's going to be encouraging the use of more community space. And I think the more we can bring the community into our schools um, is, is critical. And uh, from the operational perspective, uh, not having to make uh, cuts to staff, not having to make uh, teacher cuts and, and maintaining um, their salaries and, and and making sure that we're not uh, taking anything from our, uh, our classrooms, uh, from our teachers or our students. And Nikki. Yes, I'm going to do this a little backwards. Everyone is big on the facilities referendum, which is excellent, and people have spoken wonderfully about it. But to me, the operation referendum, operation referendum is the most important. Buildings are nice, and our buildings definitely need to be upgraded. But, with, but a building is just a shell. It matters who you put in it. It matters the teachers, the staff. If we want to recruit teachers of color to stay here, we need to have a curriculum that's engaging, challenging, and a, and a budget that pays them what they are worth. That can't be done without a solid operating referendum that puts COLA, steps and lanes, it, meaningful insurance, representation without having to pay large premiums or even large deductibles and basically gives people the chance to keep their doctors as for the as for the um uh, as for the um capital referendum i've been to all 50 of our schools this past, in the year before last um took me about nine months to do it we need the uh, west had tiles that were falling off the pool east had some significant areas that if anyone had vision issues were problematic. La Follette has a pit that has been there since I was three years old. And it's gigantic because of where the library is, but it's almost inaccessible in parts. These are situations that need to be addressed because our students deserve better. I don't just want to compete with neighboring districts. I want to give our students the best because they deserve the best. Hey, thanks. This uh, next question, uh, basically the second to last, um, is from Scott. And we'll start with Chris. What is your plan as a board member to encourage and strengthen the trust-based relationships that are at the heart of the school system uh, between uh, students, teachers, administration, faculty, and parents? 
I've, I've talked about this a lot and building trust is key to all of the work that we're doing, whether we're talking about um, closing achievement gaps or making sure that, that students feel valued um, in our schools. We have to make sure that um, we, everybody has the tools that they need to build the relationships and strengthen relationships um, with our students and with our families. Um, our, our staff have to be able to trust the, the administration and board members that we are listening um, to their experiences in the schools and taking um, their feedback into um, consideration when we are making decisions. Um, trust is the foundation of, of everything that we're doing and, and we need to make sure that we're building that as a board member. Um, we're assigned, we would be assigned a number of schools, every board member is assigned schools and it's important to make sure that I think I would I would prioritize getting out into those schools and really learning um, the, the concerns and what um, students, families, staff, um, how they see their schools working and, and what they want to see um, done differently. All right. So, you know, when we talk about restorative justice, um, you know, we can't just talk about it as a alternative for disciplining black kids. We have to embrace it as a conceptual tool to heal those breaches of trust that have uh, been, uh, that have existed in our, our district across years. And so, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, some, some uh, events that may occur, the response has to be better and we have to, um, you know, come forth in a, uh, honest manner, uh, committed to re reconciliation and healing the harm that has been done. Um, and then we also have to look at ways that we are more transparent and offer uh, some opportunities for meaningful decision making at the classroom, school, and district level for parents to, uh, you know, so they have uh, more buy in uh, with our district and the decisions that are being made. Um, and finally, you know, we have to acknowledge where wrong has been done. That's part of the restorative justice process. And we have to be committed fully to reconciliation and healing. Wayne? I just want to really emphasize the importance of community engagement and making sure that we are listening to people, um, you know, in the community. And so often I, I hear stories about, you know, people having issues in the district and, and, and not feeling like they're being heard or feeling like they were somehow treated unfairly. Um, and so I just want to make sure that, you know, um, that we're listening to those people. I attended the meeting, I think it was back in January at uh, Jefferson, at, uh, Jefferson uh, uh, Middle School um, and listening to the parents there talk about their concerns. And, you know, one of the things that consistently comes up with these parents and even the staff is, is, is school safety, you know, making sure that our, our, our schools are safe, making sure that uh, they're free of harassment and, and, and bullying and that uh, students have a safe space where they can report these incidents when they do occur. So listening to, to, to families, listening to parents, the community and engaging them and, and a real meaningful dialogue about what some of the, uh, what are some of the ways as a, as a whole community that we can work to make our district better. Uh, that's gonna be critical, I think. Okay, Nikki? Yes, um, we, transparency is an absolute must. Um, this is how I do it. One, all meetings should have public comments. Two, we shouldn't have any workshops. All meetings should be done where people could comment no matter what on the issue because otherwise if people aren't heard, we represent the public that should be done in that manner. Three, we need to go into the community more. We're finally figuring out how to do that technology wise. I'm finding Zoom does work very well and I think that we could hold meetings that way in the community because how many people are gonna get there at 5 p.m. on a Monday night when they're working one to two jobs and raising children? And we have to be 100% honest of our past, state where we've made mistakes, and most importantly, we have to trust our teachers and give them buy-in. Instead of creating a system where if the teacher complains, they're worried about job security. I have teachers who are afraid to sign the Climate and Culture Survey because they're afraid of retribution. 
That's not how you improve a school. You have to actually be allowed to comment without fear of retribution or retaliation. So I think that it's it, it's really important to start from the bottom up and not necessarily from the top down. Um, I think that it's important to engage students um, and engage you know the parents um, as a parent of a newly at the time when my kids were just starting to go to school, it was really hard for me to trust the schools. Um, and that was just from my own experience going through Madison schools. Um, and so it, it took a while for me to build the relationship with the principal and the staff that worked there. Um, but once that happened, it actually, you know, it flourished and, you know, and whatnot. So I think it's, it's extremely important to make sure that we acknowledge um, the issues that we're having um, and part of that is also making sure if we're going to make a commitment that we follow through. And I think that that is the biggest thing that the trust um, between a lot of the different parties, whether it's parent, teachers, um, administration, is the follow through. And I don't think that, you know, like, I think that we just need to make sure um, that we do that. Um, so as a board member, I think that that's one of the biggest things that I would do is, is really, if I'm going to have a commitment, um, to try my best to follow through. Um, again, it's seven members. Um, I'm one of them if I am elected. So um, that is something to engage all stakeholders. All right, thank you. Uh, so actually we will now uh, get to uh, closing remarks. So each of you will have one minute still. And um, as much as possible, um, our um, panel journalists and students um, ask you know, each of you to focus on um, one final question um, within your closing remarks. So what is the core educational weakness in MMSD um, and what is the core strength? Um, so if you can fit that into your closing remark, that would be great. And uh, we'll go ahead with Savion. Thank you. So I, I want to start off by thanking our educators and community during this time of unprecedented challenge and need. Uh, we are rising to the occasion of embracing what community education looks like in this environment. Um, and it underscores why, you know, what this experience has exposed for the community underscores why I'm running for school board. Not every student has a reliable bed to sleep in or food on the table or enjoys the privilege of family wealth to purchase an advantage. And so for these students at risk, we're told that, you know, uh, education is our means to rise above our condition, yet our, uh, in a lot of schools across America and in our district, we are not fulfilling that promise. So that's why I'm running to help s systematically change that. Um, something that, that our district does well is that, you know, we, um, something that our district does well right now is that we are really open to embracing new ideas and explicitly calling out black black excellence and what that means. Uh, something that our district has to do better on uh, at a core level is um, moving beyond you know talk and going to action. Um, yeah, that's that's the one minute. Wayne. So, um, so I think, first of all, I want to thank the Simpson Street Free uh, Press for this uh, time to uh, talk about uh, um, our campaigns. And I think that, you know, I think we really need to focus on, for, for, many, for many, many years now, decades actually, we've, we, we've talked about this achievement gap or the opportunity gap. And so I think what we need to really do is develop some concrete strategies around that. I have a plan that I think will help reduce the, um, the, uh, uh, disparity in terms of the um, suspensions that I think are are really at the heart of the achievement gap for, for African American students in particular. I think one thing that the district does really well, and I'm very pleased about this, is collaborations and partnerships that, that we do. And I think that as a board member, I would certainly work to strengthen all of those because I think that they're they're critical keys to the success of the district as a whole. Thank you. Um, yes. If I, I ran for re-election because I am a voice for the voiceless, I want to represent the underrepresented students, those who are black, those who are brown, those who are disabled, those are, who are disenfranchised, and because these are all of our students, and I want to make sure that their needs are met. Our, right now, one of our biggest challenges 
he is providing reading and concrete instruction in a manner that is both culturally relevant and flexible for both special education and regular education students. What we do well as a district is our community, that is our community of teachers who truly care and love our students and are, have created a home for them as best they can. However, we need to do more to support them. I ran for, I ran for many reasons, but I provide strength to the board, knowledge to the board, and the ability to advocate for those who have a, had a voice in the past. Maya. Um, thank you, Simpson Street Free Press, for having us today. Um, I think one thing that the board does well is definitely um, the collaborations and, and community relationships. Again, seek, one of the things that I've been pushing is the seeking more investment from them. Um, but I think, you know, what we need to work on is um, the inequality um, of education for our students. Um, one of the keys to effectively address racial inequalities um, is definitely listening and responding to people who have experienced them. Um, we need to make sure that we don't take away from the sincere efforts um, to be helpful by the people who have not had the experience, um, but to understand that it is happening and the classrooms and the hallways between people applies um, also to teachers and students as well. So if we're serious about the change that we need to make, um, we have to start listening. Um, definitely look at what happened with the BSU um, and the board listening to them. Um, I think for me as a board member, I definitely have the experience of going through the process and understanding decisions made in my right as a parent, but also too as a student going through all of Madison School. So, you know, I, I sat in the advanced placement classes where it, I was the only student of color. Um, and, you know, I've, I speak five languages and it, it really um, hurts when you remember um, being almost shamed for being that student, that black student who was always in the AP classes. So um, I think that it's listening is something that we definitely need to focus on. Thank you. Chris, you Thanks to the Simpson Street Free Press um, for um, organizing tonight's forum and to everyone for participating um, during this really challenging time. Um, and thank you, like Savion said, to all the educators, families out there who are, who are trying to get through this time. Um, we are in this together and I, um, the community response um, hopefully we'll continue to support people in the way that's needed. Um, we've talked a lot about issues tonight and I think one thing's clear for everybody is that this is a critical time for the Madison schools. Um, we have important decisions to make and challenges to face. I'm optimistic that we can meet those challenges and I'm excited about the possibility of joining the Madison School Board to, to work on that. Um, I think what I've heard is that people are interested in moving beyond words and taking action on equity issues and that's something we definitely need to do um, to address the challenges that the district faces. Um, community investment and community partnerships are a strength for us and so we need to continue that. Um, I've been deeply involved in our Madison schools for 10 years and I'm going to be able to get right to work making positive change happen for students. I'm supporting teachers and staff and building trust in our community and increasing um, accountability and transparency. And um, I would be honored to earn your vote and urge everyone to vote um, from home with an absentee ballot um, just to make sure that we are able to participate in keeping everyone safe in doing so. Thank you and stay well, everyone. Thank you to all five candidates for participating this evening, um, especially in this interesting way to do a school board uh, forum. I really appreciate your patience and your time. Uh, and thank you to the journalists and students for helping the public learn more about our school board candidates. Uh, Simpson Street Free Press, we will uh, publish this discussion on Facebook, YouTube, and um, SimpsonStreetFreePress.org. So again, thank you for participating, and remember, never hand in your first draft.